right, well, good evening, and <laughs> we had a surprise attack this evening. It wasn't really an attack, but it could have been an attack. Our enemy, you know, I, I feel like the Lord's been sharing with me lately, and, and usually when he shares with us, I, I, he shares something that he's already shared with us before, but uh, he kind of reshares, rehashes, reiterates to us, but he just reminded me of the spiritual warfare that we have in our lives and that it's, it's for the most part, I mean, it's the enemy working against us. That, that the world wants you to think that that's all a bunch of hocus pocus and, and there's no enemy. But the truth is, there is an enemy. And the truth is, there, the enemy wants to see us down and out and struggling and not being victorious in, in life and really being victorious in life has about 100% to do with if we're walking according to what God has called us to walk in. So anyways, I don't know why I'm saying that, but there you go. Numbers chapter 18, if you guys need a Bible, <clears throat> you can raise your hand. Somebody will bring you a Bible. If you want to flip it open to Numbers chapter 18, that'd be extra sweet. Thank you so much. John's on duty. John? Thank you, John. What page? Uh, mine is page one, but it's a whole different thing. One fourteen. We got a one fourteen. Anybody else got something? Two twenty three. I'll turn there. Numbers eighteen is one forty eight in mine. So, anyways. Um, we left off last week um, in, in Numbers, we went through Numbers, the end of Numbers 16, and we went through the beginning of Numbers 17. Numbers 16, if you guys remember, that's, I mean, that's really where we're picking up. It's still in the same flow of Numbers 16. It was the rebellion of Korah, that's correct. The rebellion of Korah. And she was a mean old lady, actually it was a guy, but every time I read that I think of Korah is a woman, but it's not. It's a man. So anyways, it's just the culture that we live in. You have to deal with me, and you have to give me grace. But he rebelled directly against the leadership. Him and two others rebelled directly against the leadership. They have been swallowed up by the earth. Moses said, if you're, if you're going to rule, then nothing will happen to you. You're going to die like a normal death. And if you're not, and God's will isn't for you to rule, then the earth will open you up and swallow you. And the earth opened up and swallowed them, and everybody ran, if you remember that. And uh, it was, <laughs> yeah, it probably was a sight to see, you know. After that, all this, oh, you just see the mob oh, running away, and they're scared that God would swallow them up in the old place, and that he couldn't swallow them up where they were, but he can, and anyways, he didn't do it. But the 250 men, the leadership that followed Korah, the men of renown, they uh, were not swallowed up. What happened to them? The fire of the Lord came out and burned them, and burned them up, and their censers were left on the ground. And then of the remaining, if you remember, after all that happened the next morning, the remaining of the children of Israel did what? Murmur, 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 complained. They murmured, they complained. And the remaining of the children of Israel, what happened? A plague came in. Moses said, Aaron, quick, go make an offering. And Aaron, we remember, 80-year-old something, took off running. <sighs> Their jeans were so much better back then. They were more like a gown. Oh, I'm just kidding. Bad joke. But anyways, he took off running. He, he made sacrifice, and the plague stopped. But there was still 14,700 killed by the plague. And then once again, the Lord um, proved in, verse, in chapter 17, just to reiterate, you know, that was kind of the negative. All the people that weren't supposed to be leading, that were trying to, they all died. And now the positive is I'm going to prove, and if you remember how he did that, Aaron's rod budded, right? Aaron uh, put his rod up there against all of the other, um, the leader, uh, whichever leaders were left at this point, uh, one from each tribe, so all 12 rods were put into that holy place, left overnight, and when they woke up in the morning, lo and behold, there was fruit. There was fresh almonds. I mean, it doesn't get any fresher than that. I mean, that was overnight almonds, so... And it was one of those things where God showed them exactly who he, that 
I know I've, I've said this, I'll reiterate it again. He didn't change his mind. He didn't change his mind. And when he picked you and when he called you and when he chose you, he's not changing his mind. He wants you to be in his kingdom. And he wants you to be with him forever. I can't wait for forever. We always get forever skewed in our minds and we say, well, after one million years of forever. No, forever, eternity is, is outside of time. It's the absence. There's no time. You don't measure it like that. We're not going to. And if you try to, you're going to get your mind blown because it's not in time. Anyways, that's a whole other study. <clears throat> But this next section, Numbers chapter 18, I find it refreshing because after this huge lesson that we get corrected over and over, uh, the last few, three lessons we've learned, man, they've been hard ones. The one where the children of Israel refused to go into God's will and God said, okay, well then you can go back out into the wilderness and you're just going to die out there. Those are difficult lessons. Hopefully we're learning and we're pulling and we're taking from the lessons as we go through. But after these hard corrections, God, once again, his tender heart says, now I want to remind you of what I've already told you. This is what I have for your life. You know, hopefully we're in that place. <laughs> hopefully we're in a place where we can just take and say, God, remind me what you have for my life because I want to live for you. And his ways are better, but it's amazing that God does that with us. He corrects us and then he gives us direction. There's not like a radio silence here. He puts chapter 16 and all of its horrificness behind, I don't know if that's a word, but he puts that behind him and behind them. And he says, now let's remember where we're headed. It's, it's awesome. So maybe some of you guys need some of that refreshment tonight. Say, my old sinful past, I'm putting that back behind me and I'm going ahead, a new creation in Christ. Amen. Amen. So Numbers chapter 18, verse 1, And the Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons and your father's house with you shall bear the iniquity related to the sanctuary. And you and your sons with you shall bear the iniquity associated with your priesthood. So moving right along with some of these reiterations, God speaks to Aaron concerning the priesthood that he would continue on, he and his sons, and that they're going to continue doing what he instructed them to do, making sacrifice and offerings, bearing the iniquities, uh, and then ministering to the people. So it's kind of a, a difficult little text to figure out exactly what they're doing. Some of it, it kind of seems like they're, they're going to be making sacrifice for themselves first again. That makes sense. Um, and, and it goes right into this with the Levites, what they're going to be doing starting in verse 2 and what their calling is. So verse 2 says, Also bring with you your brethren of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your father, that they may be joined with you and serve you, while you and your sons are with you before the tabernacle of witness. And they shall attend to your needs and all the needs of the tabernacle, but they shall not come near the articles of the sanctuary and the altar, lest they die they and you also. They shall be joined with you and attend to the needs of the tabernacle of meeting for all the work of the tabernacle. But an outsider shall not come near to you. So he reminds them of the Levites. He reminds the Levites of their role in service. He reminds them to be joined in service with the Levites. This is what's going to happen. They're going to come in. This is how they're going to, this is what they're going to do. They're going to be attending to the needs of the tabernacle, and they're going to, in regards uh, to, the, to keeping the work of the tabernacle, this is what they're going to do. They're going to serve. They're going to serve. And then he goes in in verse 5, he says, and you shall attend to the duties of the sanctuary, the duties of the altar, that there may be no more wrath on the children of Israel. So he goes on and tells them, the reason I'm reminding you of this is so there's no more ouchies, right? There's no more pain. There's no more hurts. I'm reminding you of the word that I've already spoken so that you don't get hurt. Does it sound familiar? I know it does in my life. I thank you, God, that you remind me of the word that you've already spoken so I don't get hurt. So Because that's what it is, man. When we disobey God... We might think we're going to go have some fun or whatever, but it ends up hurting us. 
And isn't that God's heart? I also, when I'm looking at this, I see the other half of the coin, the other side of the coin that says, Levites, remember that I have called you. And if you get challenged in your service to me, you can stand in my calling. Not in your strength or in your work, but you can stand in my calling. If somebody says, well, I want to do what you're doing. You go, no, I remember what the Lord told me. This is my calling, and this is what God's called me to do. You take it up with him, right? I'm going to be doing what God's called me to do, and that's what we should be doing. Then verse 6, he says, Behold, I myself have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. So God says, I've taken them. And I'm giving them as a gift to you, given by the Lord, to do the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Therefore, you and your sons shall attend to your priesthood for everything at the altar and behind the veil, and you shall serve. I give your priesthood to you as a gift for service, but the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. There's a couple of sections that I have underlined in here, and it's really about the gift part, the gifts to be given. So a couple of reminders. The first one is this. Servants are a gift. He goes in there and says, I'm giving you the Levites as a gift. Servants are a gift. And, and I, when I think of this, I don't think of like slaves, like, yeah, I wish I had a couple of servants. That's not the way that I'm... I'm looking at this. What I'm looking at this like is that people in my life that serve alongside me, that serve the living God, I consider them a gift, a precious thing, an awesome thing in my life to have people that will come alongside and serve with me. It's a privilege. It's a gift to have like-minded people in your life to serve alongside of for the kingdom of God. And the second gift is there in verse 7. He, he makes a note. It is a gift for you to serve God. It's an awesome thing for us. He tells Aaron and his sons that, that he gives them the priesthood to serve, and it's a gift. You know, I, I, I heard something from a men's retreat a few years ago that really stuck with me, and every once in a while, I don't know why, it just pops in my head. It was a little, a little thing that John, Pastor John uh, Brown said. And he, he kind of said it like this. God saved us. This is what God has done for us. He saved us. And that was enough. That would have been enough if that's all he did was save us with his son. That's really more than we deserve. But he didn't stop there. Then he called us friends. And that was more than enough, but he didn't stop there. He, no, he adopted us and called us. He called you his son and his daughter. That's my kid. But he didn't stop there. As his children and as citizens of his kingdom, in spite of all of our past and in spite of the failures that we're going to have in our future, he invites us to serve alongside him. He knows we're going to mess up. And he says, that's okay. Come and serve with me. I, it blew my mind. When he said that, I don't know why. Maybe it's just something the Lord was doing in my heart. It blew my mind. And I thought, I don't deserve to be able to serve or even speak your name. But you want me, you want me to represent you? Are you serious? I have issues and drama. Are you kidding? I might make a fool out of your name. And he takes chances on people. He says, no, I want you, and I want you to serve. And what an awesome gift that we have. All of these things that God has given us, they're gifts that we don't deserve, and that's called grace. Undeserved favor from God. Oh, the grace of God in our lives. What an amazing, awesome God we have. But another reminder that I put in here. When we're looking at the Levites and the priests and their specific callings and no outsider comes in or else they die. And really, God's word is true because you look back at Korah and they died. It happened. But a reminder for us, you have a specific calling on your life, a calling that I cannot do, a calling that I can't fulfill because it's your calling. It's not for me. And I have a calling on my life that you can't do and you can't fulfill because it's my calling on my life. And so uh, 
the question is, are we doing our calling? Do we know what God's calling us to do, and are we faithful in that? And may we be faithful in the small things. Amen? So in this next section, and starting in verse 8, really it's 8 through 20, the Lord is going to share his plan for providing for the priests and their families. Uh, He's going to go into this, but I'm just going to spill the beans a little bit beforehand. When they go into the land of Israel, the Levites and the priests aren't going to get a piece of land. They're not going to get land to them. So God is basically sharing, this is how I'm going to provide. So verse 8, And the Lord spoke to Aaron, Uh, Here, I myself have also given you charge of my heave offerings, all the holy gifts, the children of Israel, I'm sorry, all the holy gifts of the children of Israel, I have given them as a portion to you and your sons and as an ordinance forever. This shall be yours of the most holy things reserved from the fire. Every, so this is, he he goes, this is it. This is what you're going to get. Every offering of theirs, every grain offering, and every sin offering, and every trespass offering, which they render to me, shall be most holy for you and your sons. In a most holy place you shall eat it. Every male shall eat it. It shall be holy to you. So, uh, when you look at this, he's, he's right now he's feeding the priests and he's feeding their boys. Um, and one commentary brought out the fact that this part of it was even a little bit more still of the priestly service, the priestly duty. And what it is is that the priests are to be relatable to these people bringing their offerings by being a part of all these areas of really of, of spirituality, of, of a spiritual walk. And what I mean by that is when they bring a grain offering, they're, they're worshiping, and it's a gift. It's a celebratory time. It's a praise time. It's a worship time. And the priests rejoice with them, and they partake of it. They eat of it, and they praise God. And you know what? I love it. It's the same thing in our lives. When somebody comes in and goes, Dude, you can't believe what God did. This, this, and this. Then we're, yes, praising with you. Yes, it's awesome. I, God, he comes through. Mm, I just love it when God comes through. And it makes me want to do all those things that I'm trying to, f- mm, yeah, Woo, high five, fist pump, whatever it is, knuckles. And then the opposite of that, though, is when they bring in a sin or a trespass offering. The priests were to partake of that as well. They were to participate of that. So when you make a mistake or when there's failure in your life, the priest is to say, I'm here for you, to help you bring those things to the Lord and to be right with him. And it's the same for us. It's true. We need someone like that in our lives that we can bring failure to and trust their love and come to a place where we're coming back before the Lord, and that's how we want to do it. We want to always bring them back before the Lord and say, man, we've got to be right with God. Number one priority. Number one priority is this relationship right here. We've got to be right with God. We've got to make things right. So what an awesome picture that is. And then moving on in verse 11, he's going to feed some more people. This also is yours, the heave offering of their gift with all the wave offerings of the children of Israel. I have given them to you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. All the best of the oil, all the best of the new wine and the grain, their first fruits which they offer to the Lord, I have given to you. So God provides for the priest's household. Basically, he says, whoever's clean in your house, you take this back to your house. Whoever's clean in your house, eat it. It's your provision. And notice something there, right? It's not like the leftovers. They get the best. And really what God is saying there, what he's showing us through that is that God provides for those who serve him. He provides for the servants of the Lord. And I say, thank you, Jesus. And I know God's word is true, that he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and how many of these things will be added? Man, God, he's too good. All these things will be added. (laughs) <laughs> all the things we don't deserve. Every gift that we get from God, it's just, when I look at it, I think of it honestly, it's grace. I don't deserve it. 
I don't deserve to have, you know, whatever the things that I have. I don't deserve to have a car that works. I don't deserve, I don't, you know, all these things, but God gives and he blesses us and he takes care of us because he's good, not because we deserve it. Thank you, Lord. Right? There again, back to grace. So then he moves on to the first uh, fruit offerings. God gives them to the priests. And then verse 13, he says, For uh, whatever first ripe fruit is in their land, which they bring to the Lord, shall be yours. Everyone who is to clean your house may eat it. I'm sorry, not to clean your house. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. It's the wrong kind of servant again. Okay. My mistakes are very funny. Verse 14, every devoted thing in Israel shall be yours. Everything that first opens the womb of all flesh, which they bring to the Lord, whether man or beast, shall be yours. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man you shall surely redeem, and the firstborn of the unclean animals you shall redeem, and those redeemed of the devoted things you shall redeem when one month old, according to the valuation for five shekels of silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, which is 20 geras. But the firstborn of a cow, the firstborn of a sheep, or the firstborn of a goat you shall not redeem, for they are holy. You shall sprinkle their blood on the altar and burn their fat as an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. And their flesh shall be yours, just as the wave breast and the right thigh are yours. All the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offered to the Lord, I have given to you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord with you and your descendants with you. So God takes seriously his provision for those who serve him. So much that he makes this covenant with the priest that those who would serve the Lord, he would always provide for them. So it's, it's an interesting thing, but here in this section, God is giving them all of those first fruits offerings. Every single one of them from the, from the actual fruit to uh, the, the, and we've gone through this before. This is something they were supposed to do. I think it was in Leviticus. Um, but of course, they're not giving the, the uh, firstborn of the, of the children to them anymore because those were bought by the sacrifice, by the blood at the Passover. So it's just a picture of, we, instead of giving them the firstborn, now they just buy back the firstborn. So anyways, there's all these firstborn things, but God, I love how the seriousness of this provision. He's like, I'm going to provide to you, and he says, I'm promising that I'm going to give you these things. I'm going to make a covenant in verse 19 of salt for how long? For forever. I don't know if you know that movie, but it, it, it's an ordinance forever, and that's like the emphasis. It's a long time. He's gonna, not going to break it. And, and it's interesting that God uses salt as the symbol of this covenant because salt is like a preservative. Salt is, it, 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 one commentary said, now I want to do a science experiment to see if he's right or not. But one commentary said, you can't burn salt. It doesn't burn. And I thought, I bet I could burn salt. That's just me being rebellious, I guess. But, and then it, salt doesn't lose it, its flavor. It's, if you find salt, a mineral in the earth, it, it's really, really old, right? And it's got the flavor still. And it's one of those things, but Jesus said, and you might be thinking, wait a minute, but Jesus said, but what good is salt, that you're the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it loses its flavor? An interesting point, one commentary made, there's only one way that we know of that salt can lose its flavor, and that's to be diluted. That's to be put maybe into water or something, and you put more and more water, and you dilute it down to where you can't taste it anymore. To dilute it, to have so much of a foreign substance introduced into it that there's no longer flavor. That speaks a lot for our lives. That if we keep allowing those foreign worldly things into our life, it's going to dilute our witness. It's going to dilute the salt of our life. 
And salt isn't good if its flavor is lost. There's no point. What's the point to sprinkle flavorless salt on your food? There's no point. Unless you like chewing grainy things, I guess, or granules or whatever, but anyways. Man, may our lives be pure. And I'm saying that for myself too. God, may our lives be pure. May we listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And when he says something, when he says, turn the radio station or shut that off, may we go, yes, Lord. Because I want more of you and I want less of the world. I don't want to lose my flavor. This world is going to be over before we know it. I have a teenager next month, but I still can't believe it. I go, Lord, what? And everyone else is going, oh, it's going to just go faster from here, you know. I say, stop it. I have gray hairs in my beard. And I have another baby, which equals more gray hairs in my beard. Verse 20, moving on from all of my problems, because God is the answer. Verse 20, then the Lord said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in their land, nor shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the children of Israel. So this, this is going to be the same with Aaron and the priests, and it's going to be the same with the Levites. God's describing how he's going to take care of the priests and the Levites because, like I said, when it comes time to enter the land, they don't get land. And, and in that day and age, having land was a, good, a big deal. You might think now, like, I don't need a lot of land. I could just have a house and I'll be okay or have some shelter, whatever. I could stay in a condo with no land and have a deck. I'll be all right, you know, whatever it is. But in, in this day and age, it was a big deal because having land, not having land, meant not having crops and not being able to have flocks or herds. So not having land really equals to no income, no food, nothing on the table. So God reveals how he's going to take care of them, and he's already revealed some of it regarding the priests. But the best promise of all isn't how he's going to feed the priests with food and the offerings. It's not how he's going to provide income for the Levites that serve him. And you know, it's funny because it's easy for us. It's easy for me. It's easy for us to have our eyes fixed on those things. House, car, income, bigger, better, whatever. It's easy for us to have our eyes on worldly things. But the best thing that they get is him. He is their portion and their inheritance. And it just sheds fact uh, um, it sheds light on the fact, forgive me, that the best thing in this life is a relationship with God. In a relationship with God, all the security in the world is found there. All the peace, all the comfort, all the hope, every emotional need we have is met in Christ. will be met in our relationship with him, but we have to go to him. We have to be active in this relationship in order to get those benefits. But man, <laughs> it just brings me right back to Corey Ten Boom going through one of those concentration camps and saying, you never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. But to be going through a situation like that and having peace, and hope and contentment because you have a relationship with the living God and knowing, man, the best thing that could happen to me is that I die because it's going to be glorious. It's going to be resurrection time. Man, may we be living for the heavenlies. Amen? Then he moves on to the next section and he goes on to explain how the Levites will be taken care of. So verse 21, he says, Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Hereafter the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity, and they shall uh, be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance for the tithes of the children of Israel which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord I have given to the Levites. It's interesting, we kind of got a note there um, in verse 21 and verse 24 also. God says, I give them the tithes. They're giving to the Lord and I'm choosing to give to them, not 
you know, the children of Israel aren't to be able to say, well, we pay the salary of the Levites, and we think they need to be down at the tabernacle for three hours longer every day. You know, it's not that kind of thing. No, God says, you don't worry about them. I worry about them. You give to me, and I'll decide what to do with that. And it's just an awesome thing to see. But, uh, where did I leave off? Uh, for the Lord, I have given them the Levites as an inheritance. End of verse 24, therefore I have said to them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. So God says, you serve me, and I'll take care of you. You're probably not going to be wealthy, but you're not going to be poor. You're going to be taken care of. And personally, in my life, I can say, I can attest to that. I'll tell you, also, one key to contentment in this life as it comes to things is simply to be thankful for what you have. A key to not look at everyone else, but just look at what you have and go, I can't believe you blessed me with this. I can't believe you blessed me with this. Hopefully, it's not, you know, we're not going, God, I can't believe you blessed me with this TV the size of my wall. You know, but he gives us those things too sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Just to get our eyes off the wants and be thankful for what we have, for what God, for how God has provided for you, and to know He's going to continue to provide for me. Thank you, Lord. So He says they're going to be taken care of. Really, the opposite is true. Um, wait, wait a second. Where's my? Where's my? So for those of us who, who tithe in Malachi, what God says to the children of Israel, the opposite is true. Okay, so now I'm getting my train of thought back. The opposite is true because they failed to give the tithes. God says, you're robbing who? The Levites? God says, you're robbing me because you're not giving to me. You're not giving back to me. You're ripping me off. Not anyone else, not the Levites, not Aaron. You're, rob you're ripping me off. So when we give, whether it's a tithe or an offering, we are to give it to God with a cheerful heart. And I'm going to speak a little bit more to tithing here in just a second. But let's look at verse 25. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak thus to the Levites and say to them, When you take from the children of Israel the tithes which I have given you from them as your inheritance, you shall offer up a heave offering of it to the Lord, a tenth of the tithe. And your heave offering shall be reckoned to you as though it were the grain, off, the grain of the threshing floor and its fullness of the wine press. Thus you shall also offer a heave offering to the Lord from all your tithes which you receive from the children of Israel. And you shall give the Lord's heave offering from it to Aaron the priest. So he says, you know, you're going to get this income and what do I want you to do with it the first thing? Tithe. You give to the Lord who provides for you. I'll speak to that in a minute. Verse 29. Of all your gifts, you shall offer up a heave offering due to the Lord from the best of them. <laughs> I like that. He even has to tell his leadership. Now listen, don't give the leftovers. You get the best stuff and you give that to the Lord. I love it. Uh, the consecrated part of them, verse 30, Therefore you shall say to them, When you have lifted up the best of it, then the rest shall be accounted to the Levites as the produce of the threshing floor, as the produce of the wine presses. You may eat it in any place, you and your households, for it is your reward for your work in the tabernacle of meeting. And you shall bear no sin because of it, when you have lifted up the best of it, but you shall not profane the holy gifts of the children of Israel, lest you die. So, he tells them, the Levites, you guys tithe too. You servants of God, I want you to be an example. And he reminds them, I want you to give the best. And it'll be for Aaron, and it'll be for the priests and their families. And that's something, just that, that, um, that concept, that, that model, we practice that. It's something that we do. The leadership of this church tithes. The pastors, the elders, all tithe. We don't ever have the attitude that that's not what we need to do. It's obviously we need to give to the Lord. Obviously he's given for, to us. He's provided for us. And so we get the opportunity to give back to him because he's blessed us and we love him and he is so good. He's worthy. It's an interesting 
just kind of a mind-blowing thing when you think that we have the opportunity to give to the Lord. You know he doesn't need your check, right? You know he doesn't need any of your money. He gives us the opportunity to say, God, you bless me. I want to give this little bit back. I want to drop this coin in the bucket because you're so good and you take care of my life. He gives us the opportunity because really it's, it's a blessing because, you know, the truth is from Jesus himself, it is better to give than to receive. And that's a truth. It's a fact. Like uh, Uncle Cy, right? Hey, that's a fact, Jack, right? But in our giving and our serving, we get the opportunity to be used by God to sow seeds and let him multiply our little efforts. And it's a privilege and an honor to be able to know him and serve him and give to him to invest in his kingdom. So I wanted to speak, because it talks about tithing, I wanted to speak a little bit about tithing. Because there's, there's people, I mean, really tithing is a model for us. We're not really demanded, we're not really required in the New Testament that we have to give a tithe. A tithe is a tenth. Uh, uh, but we are demanded to give. So listen to this. It's important to understand that tithing is not a principle dependent on the Mosaic law. It's not just in the Mosaic law. Hebrews 7, 5 through 9, explains that tithing was practiced and honored by God before the law of Moses. And that's when Abraham gave to Melchizedek, if you remember that. So it's not just in this law, it was before, and guess what? It is after. Because the, the New Testament does speak with great clarity on the principle of giving, that giving should be regular, planned, proportional, and private. It must be generous and freely given of a cheerful heart. And that's in from 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And since the New Testament doesn't emphasize um, tithing like a tenth, one might not be strict on it for Christians, though some Christians argue against tithing on the basis of self-interest. Like, I don't want to give that much, right? What am I going to have? But since giving is to be proportionable, uh, proportion, that's a whole new word, since giving is to be proportional, not proportionable, to what we are given, we should be giving some percentage back if it's into proportion. So 10% is a good benchmark. It's a good starting place. For some to give 10% is nowhere near enough. I heard a pastor one time say, man, if you are making a million dollars a year, you should be able to tithe 50%. Because if you can't live off $500,000 a year, something's wrong. And I'm, I'm like, I can understand. I can agree that with that. I can see that principle. And not like, we want you to give $500,000 a year because we need your money. It's just because of that principle that you're giving, that you're blessed. And to what's more, more has been given, is more shall be uh, required. So anyways, um, and for some people though, tithing 5% may be a huge step of faith. It might be tight. You go back to Jesus when he talked about the Pharisees giving and, oh, I'm giving this money and making a show out of it. And that woman who put the little mite in the, in the tithe, and he said, she gave more than all of you. They're like, what? No! You know, the Pharisees blowing it up because she gave out of what little she had. She gave all to the Lord. What an example, a monster in faith, a little poor woman, Right? And these Pharisees thinking there's something. Eesh, Lord, help us. But think about this. If our question is, how little can I give and still be pleasing to God, then our heart's not in the right place. We should have the attitude of some of the early Christians who said, we're not under the law. We're not under the tithe. We are free to give more. So giving and financial management is a spiritual issue, not just a financial one. God, lead us in that. Amen? Well, my goodness. I can't go through all of Numbers 19. We're going to be turning the corner into kind of a controversial thing. And it's an interesting chapter. It's a chapter that deals with 
uh, cleansing ceremony of the red heifer. And you guys ever heard of the red heifer? You, you heard some kind of news on the red heifer, red heifer. I remember when I was in, I think it was junior high, we had our homeroom class had this news channel called Channel One News. And uh, I remember a story on the red heifer just stuck out to me because I'm like, whoa, they're talking about Jewish things and Israel people. and What's going on over there? And they were all excited because they found a red heifer. But it seems like every time they find a red heifer, the, the, the tradition, the rabbinical tradition is, well, if there's three or more hairs that aren't red, then we got to throw them out. And I'm going, you got to be kidding me. I look in the mirror to my beard and go, man, there's some really weird colors going on. There's, there's no way. I, I don't know how that can happen. But it's one of those things where they're waiting for this red heifer, and you know a lot of them believe that once, the, once they find the red heifer, that they're going to be able to begin to start sacrifice again. To, to begin to offer sacrifices for sin. Man, I, for me, when I think about that, I think that is scary. Because what does that do? except for fly in the face of the sacrifice above all sacrifices, the Son of God. And goes back to a, a tradition instead of this relationship with Jesus that we have. Anyways, we're going to look a little bit about what it was meaning in this day and age, what the purification was going to look like, the qualification for the red heifer, and it was pretty pretty uh, stout, but we're also going to be looking at the pictures, and it might be Michael next week sharing this, uh, because I'm going to be teaching on Sunday, but it's, it, we're going to be looking at the scriptures, and we're going to be looking at the, the fulfillment, the prophetic fulfillment, the red heifer is of Christ as well. So anyways, with all that said, we're going to get out of here, so let's all stand together and we'll pray, uh, and just thank God <laughs> for his goodness in our lives, amen? God, we thank you that we get to give to you, God. And I pray th this is one of those messages, and I, I, most of them are, but I'm thankful, God, because it's one of those messages that has a few areas that really convict my heart. And I need to be spoken to. I don't need to just be standing up here talking mouth, talking head. I need to be spoken to, and I thank you for that in my life. And I want to give more to you because you've given so much for me. I thank you for that life. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the way that we look at giving and we look at tithing. I thank you, personally, I thank you that there, there isn't a plate that's passed around. I know that, that I've been in a few situations like that and I didn't have anything to put in it and I felt pretty bad. But I thank you that we give freely and we give in secret. It's between you and me. And we want to worship in it, Lord. And I thank you for that. I thank you for this place. I thank you, uh, uh, thinking back to the study night, I thank you for the gift of people that serve with us. I thank you for that, Lord. Uh, the Le Levitical service, it wasn't all up front. It was mostly helping supply the needs of the priests. And, you know, I think of the people cooking dinner and I think of the people emptying trash cans and, and making sure things are clean and paper towels are filled. God, I thank you for those that serve. It's a gift for us. And I thank you for that, Lord. And I pray for all of us in here that you would continue to make sure that calling, that we would want to do whatever your calling is. We'd want to do it fully and wholly for you. Thank you tonight for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.